The Cincinnati Bearcats have been picked to finish 13th in the Big 12. Is that a bad thing? Or I'll tell you why that's actually a good thing for the Cincinnati Bearcats. You are Locked On Bearcats, your daily podcast on the Cincinnati Bearcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Friday. Thanks so much for making Lockdown Bearcats your first listen every day. It's free and available wherever you listen to podcasts, including if you watch us on YouTube. And if you do watch us on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and follow us to get an alert every time we drop a new episode. My name is Alex Frank, your host each and every day here on Lockdown Bearcats. We are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Friday, July 7th, coming up on today's show. The Bearcats have been picked to finish 13th in the Big 12 preseason media poll. I'll explain why, excuse me, I think that's actually a good thing, excuse me, for the Cincinnati Bearcats, then I'm going to tell you why expectations are not a good thing for the Bearcats in 2023, and then I'm going to talk to you about a recent Cincinnati sports trend that I have seen in other successful cities in my lifetime. The Bearcats have been picked to finish 13th in the Big 12 Sorry, I'm adjusting my screen if you're watching on YouTube. 13th in the Big 12 in the preseason media poll. And you can take that however you want. Obviously, it's a far cry from where the Bearcats have been picked to finish in recent years. But as Toto would say, or or Toto, we're not in the American Athletic Conference anymore. So the Bearcats, second to last, it's, I I think it's a a, a welcome to the Big 12. Like, yeah, yeah. Dues are going to have to be paid, and the Bearcats are going to have to earn their way to the top of the Big 12 bowl game and all that. So the Big 12 media poll is out. Texas was picked to finish first, and that obviously, you can take that however you will. Texas obviously brings a very good team. Athlon Sports has them in, excuse me, they have them in, ranked number one in basically every position group there is. So this is this is obviously maybe not a no brain not a no brainer, but definitely not surprising. Kansas State picked to finish second. They won the Big 12 last year. Oklahoma fourth. Texas Tech oh, I'm sorry, Oklahoma third. Texas Tech fourth. TCU fifth. Baylor six. Oklahoma State seven. UCF the highest Newcomer into the Big 12, picked to finish 8th. Kansas ninth, Iowa State 10th, BYU 11, Houston 12, Cincinnati 13 with 202 votes. West Virginia 14th, Texas receiving the most first place votes with 41. Kansas State 14, Oklahoma, Texas Tech 4, TCU 3, Oklahoma State 1, Texas with the most votes at 886. So... This is, this is, I I, I, I kind of want to say a reality check that the Bearcats are going to have to earn their way. They're going to have to prove their doubters wrong. And I think what the media is, is looking at here is new head coach, new roster, new system offensively, new quarterback we don't know much about. And that is creating skepticism on a conference-wide level when it comes to the media. And that's totally understandable. I'm not here to tell you that the Cincinnati Bearcats are going to be who they have been the last five years. But this doesn't sway my belief that the Bearcats will be better than the betting lines or what the media thinks going into the preseason. Now, we have seen two Bearcats named to the all-conference first team, Dante Corleone on defense. That's not a shock at all. And Mason Fletcher on special teams, also not a shock. So there is some representation. All I'm saying is don't get down on the fact that the Bearcats are picked to finish 13th. Do preseason rankings matter? They should not. They didn't matter in 2018. They didn't matter to the Bengals in 2021 or heck the Reds this year or FC Cincinnati in any of the previous two seasons. Why should they matter to you as a Bearcats football fan? They don't to me. And look, I'm here to tell you, look, you know by now, if you've listened to this show, and and again, to the everyday listener, thank you. And 
we thank the everyday listeners and we thank those of you who choose us to make us who choose to make us your first listen every day. Lockdown Bearcats, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. But for the everyday listeners who've never missed a show, you know by now that I am an optimistic fan, always have been. And you also know that I'm the voice of reason. I'm not going to come on the show and completely bash Scott Satterfield if they lose to Pittsburgh. I'm not going to come on this show and tell you the Bearcats are the greatest team in the world if they upset Oklahoma. What I am going to tell you is how it is. I am an optimist realist, or maybe I'm a realist optimist. I'll say optimist realist. I'm optimistic, and I'm also realistic. I'm going to come on and be the voice of reason. That's my role as the host of Lockdown Bearcats. I'm going to tell you right now, don't worry about the Bearcats being picked to finish 13th. Because look at the teams who are ahead of them. Houston, they can beat Houston. BYU, okay, that might be a greater challenge. Now, BYU being picked to finish 11th surprises me. I thought they would have been a little higher than that. Iowa State 10th, okay, they had a down year last year. But can the Bearcats beat Iowa State? Sure, they play them at home. That's a plus. Kansas. Kansas had a better year last year. They have the Offensive Player of the Year in the Big 12. So there is definitely some there is definitely some talent there for the Jayhawks to work with. Um, let's see. Eighth, you have UCF. I'm not going to bash that. They had a great year last year. Oklahoma State seven. Can the Bearcats beat them? That's going to be tough. UCF's interesting. Bearcats get them at home this year, and I think they're equals because they're also playing their first season in the Big Twelve. Um. Baylor at six, TCU five. I mean, the what? And now I'm getting into the upper echelon of the Big Twelve, and I'm seeing that I'm seeing that these teams are going to be harder to beat. But look at the teams in the top five. You don't play TCU. You don't play Texas Tech. You don't play Kansas State. You don't play Texas. The only team that you play in the top five of the media poll is Oklahoma. And that's a home game. And that's going to be an energetic atmosphere that we haven't seen in quite some time in Nippert Stadium. So again, if you're worried about the Bearcats being being picked to finish 13th, and my mom asks me all the time, is that bad? No, it's not bad at all. Because it's preseason rankings. Who gives two rats tails about that? The players don't. Why should you? I would even tell you if the Bearcats are being picked to finish first. Don't let that get into your head because what that is going to do is it's going to create expectations. And I'm going to tell you why those are not a good thing for the Bearcats this year. Next, but to round out this segment, 13th in the Big, in the big 12 poll. Don't worry about it. Underdogs and my favorite kind, well, I don't know about favorite, but one type of player or team that I like in sports is the underdog because I was kind of one of those when I was in high school. When I was in high school, I ran cross country and track and I started my sophomore year. So I was, if we're, if if, to use the sports analogy down on the depth chart, but you know what I did? I worked my way up to varsity because I was scrappy because I was willing to do more than maybe others weren't willing to do. And it paid off. And so that's why I root for players who are underdogs I root for teams who are underdogs, and I root for players from teams who are scrappy, that are resourceful, that use everything they have. They may not be as gifted or as talented as other teams, but they damn sure will outwork the other teams or players. The Bearcats, when they are underdogs, are always at their best. We saw that the last five years. Did you think they were going to win 11 games in 2018? No. Did you think they were going to win? Um. Did, did, did you think that they could make the college football playoff in 2021. I'm going to be honest with you and say no. I did not think the Bearcats were going to go to the playoff. They did. So maybe being an underdog here is a good thing. There are no expectations, and that's a good thing versus if there were, excuse me, that would not be a good thing. I'll explain. Excuse me. Next on Lockdown Bearcats. Today's episode of Lockdown Bearcats is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Take your first swing at batting at, excuse me, betting MLB on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount and bonus bets up to $200. That's right. Just bet 20 bucks and you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 you can spend 
betting everything from the money line to the over-under to who you think is going to the first hit the first home run. All on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on MLB than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So sign up today. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get up to $200 in bonus bets. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel, an official partner of Major League Baseball. Coming up next week on Lockdown Bearcats, Neil Meyer. Hopefully we're going to hook up with him from uh, Big 12 Media Days down at AT AT&T Stadium in Dallas. We'll have full coverage of that on all shows next week here on Lockdown Bearcats. We are getting close to fall camp. I I mean, this is we're coming up on a really fun time because we got position group previews. We've got season previews. We've got conference previews. I mean, this is – I just – I keep telling myself, get through this month of July, and then the shows write themselves from August through essentially December, January, and then all the way through basketball season. So this is going to be an unbelievable time for you as a Cincinnati Bearcats fan, 57 days away from the first game of the season, uh, 78 days away from Oklahoma. So much to look forward to with the Bearcats joining the Big 12. So, 13th place in the Big 12 preseason media poll. That is not going to create expectations. But I firmly believe that that's a good thing. I am not a fan of um if my team, well, let me let me let me backtrack. Expectations are good, but they're also they're also what's the I'm trying to think of the word or phrase here. They can also be intimidating. They can also be pressurizing. And for as great as that 2021 team was, that team had massive expectations from January. I remember being at lunch with a friend of mine. And that was when we found out that Desmond Ritter was going to come back. That was when we found out Kobe Bryant was going to come back. That's when we found out MyJ Sanders was coming back. And so instantly that created expectations. And whether or not you wanted to buy into them, they were real. And it was fun because, oh my gosh, the Cincinnati Bearcats could go to the college football playoff. But it also was, oh boy, we better live up to them or else the season's going to be a failure. That is why expectations are not a great thing. I firmly believe that the Cincinnati Bearcats not having expectations to be good this year is going to end up being what and what makes them better than what people think. Remember 2018. And I remember 2018 vividly. I, I looked at the Bearcats schedule at the start of the season. That season, I think Tom Gresham, God rest his soul, had six wins. I think I had eight wins. Just because I remember looking at the schedule, and I was talking to my cousin about this at um our old lake house. And I, I was, we were looking at the schedule before the season started, and and, he, and and I had them winning more games than maybe some expected. I think Athlon had them at four and eight, or Phil Steele might have had them at four and eight, and maybe that was reasonable. And I remember a lot of fans were thinking, just get to six and six and make a bowl game. That's where the program was at. But when the Bearcats upset UCLA, and they, and, and they weren't supposed to win that game, when they upset UCLA, that changed the narrative. That signified this is working. What Luke Fickle's doing is working. And it created more expectations. I'm not saying they expected the Bearcats to win the AAC. We knew UCF was very good. We knew Houston was very good. We knew Memphis was very good. But at least the Bearcats were relevant locally, and they were starting to become relevant on a conference level, maybe not yet nationally. That season ended up being one of the most enjoyable seasons I covered when I was at Cincinnati. Why? Well, they went undefeated at home. Everything that happened that was terrible in 2017 righted itself in 2018. Even the UCF game, which the Bearcats lost 38-13, to I remember thinking to myself, the scoreboard is not indicative of how much the Bearcats put up a fight in that game. That's when I came away from that night thinking. I I remember vividly driving back to my apartment, listening to Mo Egger on the the postgame show on 700 WLW, and it felt like to me, the Bearcats were in the game the whole way. 21-6 at halftime, still felt good. UCF was just more opportunistic that game. The Bearcats became more opportunistic the following year. When there were expectations in 2019, 2020, 2021, yeah, the Bearcats ex- I mean, succeeded, 
They went 11 and 3 in 19. They went 9 and 1 in 2020. They made the playoff in 2021. But how did those expectations resonate with you? Look, look for me, and I, I'm, I'm a fan. Like I'm not afraid to admit it. I'm a fan when I cover the teams. That does not mean I'm a homer. That does not mean I'm not going to criticize teams like the Bearcats and Bengals when they need to be criticized. But what I am saying is, I feel the weight of expectations too, because I know if they if they had lost to let's say Tulsa in 21 or even 2019, yeah, that would have been bad. I felt the weight of if the Bearcats lose to ECU on the road, yeah, I was going to feel it. I remember if the Bearcats lost to South Florida, I was going to be miserable because that's how much I invest as a fan. Now, obviously, it means more to me than those who didn't go to the university because I am an alum. But at the same time, if you're a fan, you feel the weight of expectations. There's not that this year. Last year was tough because there were expectations, but in the back of your mind, you knew that the Bearcats could maybe lose a game that you didn't think that you maybe thought they shouldn't, but you thought they could. UCF and Tulane were the examples. That's That was last year. This year, there aren't any expectations. New head coach, new roster. I'm here to tell you that's a good thing. If you expect the Bearcats to be 9-3, and three, keep dreaming. If you expect the Bearcats to just make a bowl game, now you're thinking. Because that's what that's all I expect the Bearcats to do this year. Just find a way to make a bowl game. And even if they end up finishing 5-7, and seven, which is a possibility, I'm not afraid to admit it, at least do it in a way that sets the stage for a rebound in 2024. If you go 5-7, and seven, and you only lose one game by 10 points or more, that's fine. If you go 4-8 and eight and lose 5 games by 20 or more points, yeah, that's that's not going to be a fun offseason. You go 7-5, and five and every game that you, and you win the games you're supposed to win, and every game you lose is by 10 points or less, oh, that's fantastic. Now, you're probably screaming at me right now, Frankie, you do realize where this program has been the last five years. Um, yes, I do. But you know what else I realized? That was in the American Athletic Conference. This is the Big 12. And even the Cincinnati Bearcats, who have been really good the last five years, may need to adjust. If, I'm telling you, and, and, I, and I know, if they start two and three, you're going to come after me. That's fine. I, I'm going to say, and I'm not trying to be superior to all of you, because I'm not that. But I'm here to tell you, if they do start two and three, don't be surprised. If they start one and four, okay, maybe that's a little extreme. But a 2-3 and three start, you might have to put up with the realities of that. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing, excuse me, to put up with a 2-3 and three start? If it meant, if it meant finishing 5-2, and two, which is exactly what Scott Satterfield and Louisville did last year. You have to accept, see, one thing I've learned, one thing, I, I've, one thing I've learned, and it's become a great skill of mine, is acceptance. Look, I work in a high-pressure environment. I shouldn't say pressure. I work in a high-intensity environment at ABC6 here in Columbus. I mean, you never know when you're going to get breaking news. My first day working weekends, we had, if you live in Columbus, you know what I'm talking about, we had the Shore North shootings. No one died, thank goodness. But it was a massive scene, breaking news coverage all morning. That was my first weekend there. And ever since then, I, and I was thankful, my first day working weekend mornings. And those hours are not easy, man. But one thing, I, one thing I've learned since then is to accept the fact, yes, you're going to be working weird hours. Yes, you're going to be in a high intense environment. And there might be breaking news. And it might be stressful. And it might cause you to scream for mercy and you want to get the hell out of there. Excuse my language. But I've accepted all that. And I'm very fortunate that I like what I do including this podcast, I've accepted a lot of things in life. Stress, tired, anxiety, nervousness, etc. I've accepted a lot of things, that there's just going to be that in life. I'm telling that to you because if you're a Bearcats fan, accept the fact that this team is not going to be as good as they were three years ago 
or last year even, or two years ago. Accept that now so that when they start two and three, if they do, you're not going to be freaking out and then texting me or calling me or emailing me and asking me what the heck's going on. I'm not going to say I told you so, but I am going to, but, but I am going to say, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to be like, this is what happens when you're in a major transition like this. We saw that with FC Cincinnati in MLS. It happens. Just accept that now. And if it does happen, you're not shocked or disappointed. If they do end up being better, that's all the more better. All right, coming up. I, I've noticed a recent Cincinnati sports trend. I want to touch on that next here on Locked On Bearcats. So the Cincinnati Bearcats have had a remarkable run over the last five years. And a key character in that, and a key player in that, it was Desmond Ritter. Desmond Ritter was unbelievable in turning the Bearcats around. And when a player like his caliber changes the program, and Sauce Gardner had just as much of a say on defense, when a player of those calibers comes in and changes the program, it is revolutionizing. They raise the bar. They change the standards. And those are all very good things that you need as a fan of a program, as a part of the program, whoever you are. And we look at programs around the country. Players who made programs great. Reggie Bush made USC great in the mid-2000s. Tim Tebow made Florida great in the late 2000s. Then there was Cam Newton in Auburn. Then there was A.J. McCarron in Alabama. Then Jameis Winston in Florida State. And then Deshaun Watson at Clemson. And then Trevor Lawrence, T. Higgins. Maybe not so much T. Higgins, but Trevor Lawrence. And then Joe Burrow at LSU. Players who make programs great. And Bo Jackson at Auburn. And Charles Woodson in Michigan. All these guys who contributed to turning a program around. And in Cincinnati... Over the last 30 years, where prior to the last two years, there wasn't that much success. You think about players who have turned programs or organizations around. We've seen that in Cincinnati over the last few years. Desmond Ritter and Sauce Gardner. Joe Burrow. Now with the Reds and Ellie De La Cruz. And even Matt McClain. And uh, Will Benson. And TJ Friedel. And it's just... You're st- because for years, if you're from my generation, and I'm 24 years old, and I, I, I say I'm a child of the Manning-Brady rivalry and of the Steelers absolutely owning the Bengals. But now that we have all these great young players in Cincinnati, and the teams are having success because of it, we're starting to see the impact that a game-changing player can have. And we've seen that with the Bearcats. And with the Bearcats basketball, it was Bob Huggins. It was Nick Van Exel. It was Danny Fortson. It was Steve Logan. It was Kenya Martin. And then eventually in the rebuild, it was Sean Kilpatrick and Troy Copain and Jaron Cumberland and Gary Clark. And Bearcats football has been the same way. The Kelsey brothers. So we're starting to see that just as much as Cincinnati as like LeBron in Cleveland or Michael Jordan with the Bulls or Tom Brady with the Patriots. Peyton Manning with the Colts, Patrick Mahomes with the Chiefs, Drew Brees with the Saints. And what's great about Cincinnati is it's not the biggest market in the world. It's not New York. It's not Boston. It's not LA, not Chicago, et cetera. It's Cincinnati. But what it is, is what it is, you can you can have an impact on a mid-major program, which what Bearcats football was for a long time, or in a mid-market which is what the Bengals and Reds play in FC Cincinnati, and they're great talent. Nick Haglin, to name an example. And then you look at what is going on here. You can win at the mid-market level. Kansas City has two Super Bowl rings. Tampa Bay won the Super Bowl in in 2020. Now, they are the 13th largest television market in the United States, but still, they're not Boston, LA, New York, Chicago, Dallas. I mean, you're seeing that teams who aren't name brand, who aren't the biggest attraction on national television, what they are 
they 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 are who they are because they have players come in and change the standards. And we're seeing that now in Cincinnati. Now, another thing is, how many times over the years have you seen Boston or L.A. or San Francisco have a an NFL regular season game and then an MLB postseason game that same day? Well, I remember 2018. The Patriots had a Sunday night game against the Chiefs in the regular season. That was Patrick Mahomes, his first time on Sunday night football, and he was unbelievable that night. The Red Sox had a home game a playoff game at home at the same time. What the heck do you do there? And imagine having tickets to both. Imagine having tickets to both. Now, personally, personally, I'd be at the NFL game. Just because I've always been a football fan first. But it'd be hard. It'd be hard. I mean, that's where you wish you could be in two different places at one time. So... We might have that issue in Cincinnati. The Reds might play the Bengals, or the, I'm sorry, the Reds might play at the same time in the playoff game as the Bengals in the regular season game. And you have to ask yourself, what are we going to do? That's what you have to ask yourself. The division series, I believe, I believe would start on, well, the NLDS would be that, well, I'd have to look at the schedule, but what I'm saying is, you might have you might have that conflict and that's a good thing to have because it's it's success of both teams San Francisco had it in 2012 Joe Buck called both games Giants Niners at Kansas